So if you're here in this room right now, you care about your qubits living longer. And good news for you, I'm going to tell you about the latest experimental results where we were able to achieve state-of-the-art lifetimes with error-corrected qubits. Here's the exhaustive list of authors who made this work possible, and I'm a theorist on the team speaking on behalf of all of them. So quantum information doesn't come very easy to us. Here's a huge dilution refrigerator. It's about my height or, to <coughs> my height or taller. You cool this down to 10 to 20 millikelvin, Kelvin, and then you place your qubit at the very bottom of this dilution refrigerator where it's the coldest, your superconducting qubit. And now this qubit can still be affected by errors that find its way. For example, the T1 error, which is also called uh, relaxation error, it is similar to your bit flip, takes qubit state one to qubit state zero, qubit state zero to qubit state one. You could have T2 errors, which are dephasing errors, messes up your superposition of uh, one state and zero state, taking the plus state to the minus state and vice versa. Now, these errors then limit the lifetime of your qubit as follows. Here's a graph where I show various qubit, superconducting qubit technologies that have been realized over time. The y-axis shows the year, the x-axis shows their lifetime in nanoseconds. So, I show this graph all the way up to 2012, and then after that, it kind of plateaus the um, development in lifetime, the improvement in lifetime. Um, the state-of-the-art lifetime is actually given by this paper in 2021, which stands at 0.3, millisec 0.3 milliseconds, yes. Uh, we don't really want our qubits to live for just 0.3 milliseconds for various reasons, like quantum memories for internet protocols, um, for your quantum advantage simulations, which have circuits rather long. Um, and I don't think 0.3 milliseconds would be enough to cover it, perhaps at the rate at which we do gates right now. So um, can, we, can we do something else apart from relying on microwave chip designs to lower the probability of these T1, T2 error events to make our qubits better? Can we actively keep these errors in check while they're happening and uh, decrease the error probability on my qubits? The answer was, uh, the question was positively answered by Peter Shor in terms of quantum error correction with his error correcting code um, in 1994. Here's a graph of all the latest demonstrations of active error correction that have taken um, place in the past few years with superconducting qubits. And it shows how error correction improved or made the lifetimes of these qubits you started off with worse. The red arrows show that the, the, that the qubit lifetime was made worse using error correction, and the green arrows show that it, would, it was made better. The SCs one, two, three, one through three are surface code experiments. Um, SC3 is the experiment by Google. HH is the heavy hex by IBM. And um, all of these are your discrete variable codes, as I call it. And then CAT, BIN, GKP, all of these are, um, uh, belong to the class of oscillator codes. And you can see only the, two, the only two green arrows which, which have made things better for you are, uh, belong to these oscillator code class. And our work uses another uh, code that belongs to this specific class of oscillator codes called the GKP codes, and we stand right here. So with the maximum gain in lifetime um, of the qubit you started off with. Now, the, um, the uh, talk would be outlined as follows. First, I'll tell you what these oscillator codes are, why we care about them. Then I'll tell you about the, um, the, uh, this, this work where we, we were able to achieve the QEC gain record. I'll tell you what that is in a bit. And then I'll conclude with some closing remarks about how to use this qubit further. So let's begin with um, how to encode information in what I call oscillators what these are, and how can, we, how can we define QEC gain and break even with these codes. So let's start with a very general definition of error correction, um, the NKD nomenclature. So I take N physical qubits, or two-level systems, and then I'm going to measure 
some n minus k operations on these n qubits to restrict the number of possible states on these n qubits to effectively realize k logical qubits or k block spheres. And then what I can do is I can use those n minus k measurement outcomes to detect and correct for errors that happen anywhere on these n qubits. Now the question marks just indicate that you will need this error correction uh, routine will need to find exactly where the error happened for it to correct. Well, if I talk about the very basic requirement to be fulfilled here, I'd want to encode a single logical qubit that can correct for, say, a single error on any of these qubits. That would require at least, the most efficient code to do that, it requires at least a five five um, physical qubits. So without, five, without using five physical qubits, you cannot detect or, and correct for errors, uh, for single arbitrary errors on this n qubit system. Now, what I've done here is I've made a many body entang many qubit entangled state on my left. Ah, oh, no, this is my right, yeah, on my right. And that effectively realizes the superposition of many quantum states. So what I've done here is I've taken many two-level systems and, or many, uh, yeah, many two-level systems to realize many superposition of many quantum states. Instead of using many two-level systems, what I could do alternatively is use a single system with multiple quantum states. And such a system is actually a harmonic oscillator. So this system just has infinite number of levels. I'm going to use a finite number of those to encode my logical qubit with just two levels. And encode a log, um, and basically correct for errors in, that happen in this oscillator. Now, this gives us the freedom to use a single um, physical system to encode a logical qubit uh, in contrast with the many qubit approach on the top. Now, you would think that in order to compress a multiple, multiple quantum state uh, system to two-level system, you would require many, 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 many measurements. But that's not the case, essentially because the operators I would measure in this uh, oscillator system uh, does not have binary outcomes like plus minus one. So on the top, when you measure these n minus k operators, you're measuring Pauli operators, which will either have an outcome of plus one or minus one, so binary outcome. But for the operators in this oscillator, the outcomes will not be plus minus one. The information that you will get with, by measuring these operators would get, comprise, comprise of information of many bits. So you've already, by measuring just like two single, two stabilizer measurements, these n minus k operators are called stabilizers, just by measuring two such stabilizer operators, you will have enough information to compress this multiple, multiple quantum state system to two levels. And you can think of these, um, alternatively, you can think of this multiple uh, quantum state system as comprising some sort of continuous variables like position and momentum. It's something like infinite quantum, assist, uh, infinite quantum states is equivalent to continuous quantum states. So these sort of operators will have continuous eigenspectrum. I'm just giving you an idea of um, the spaces because we will be using the spaces in the code that I'm going to talk about. Now, before moving forward, let's define what I mean by um, error correction gain or the advantage. Let's quantify the advantage that comes from error correction. So the fundamental aim of quantum error correction is that you should be at least as good as the qubit system you started off with. So essentially, let's say in the NKD picture, you should be better than, you should be at least as good as the best qubit you can define on that n qubit system. If not, then you can throw away your n qubits and just use that single qubit to do your quantum computation. Why do I need n qubits to do something that is better done by a single qubit? So then that gives me um, a measure to quantify my error correction gain as the ratio of the um, lifetime of the logical qubit and the lifetime of the physical qubit. When this is greater than one, we say we are in the beyond break-even regime. That is, we have improved the lifetime of the best physical qubit I could, achieve, I could have achieved in my system without any error correction. This should not be confused by 
uh, with a well sought property of threshold, which says that for a family of codes below a physical error rate, you can always decrease your logical errors by increasing the code size or by increasing the number of qubits in the NKD nomenclature. Now, this gives you the, uh, a guarantee that at some point you will be able to achieve the um, desired error rate for your quantum circuits or memory or whatever. But break-even still stands to be the functional utility of error correction. If you haven't achieved break-even, being below threshold doesn't count. However, um, beyond break-even cube, these beyond break-even oscillator codes should not be taken to be competing with below threshold QEC. We definitely want below threshold QEC. So I would say that you should, become, you should take these um, oscillator codes competing with your transmon qubits that you use. You can take multiple of these oscillator codes, run their stabilization routine or error correction routine on top, and then you can measure your favorite code with a non-zero threshold on top of these qubits to realize below threshold QEC. This in turn would give you an enhanced performance for below threshold QEC, Q, uh, sorry, QEC essentially because you're using a low error qubit at the base layer of this below threshold QEC essentially will decrease the number of qubits n required to reach a desired um, error probability with your final logical qubit. Okay, so now I'm gonna define the break even for our setup here. Here's a cartoon um, of the setup we use. The, green, the gray space around the tunnel is basically the superconducting cavity which uh, contains your os uh, your oscillator with multiple states. Uh, this is essentially um, a superconducting cavity where many, where the different levels tell you how many quantas of energy these levels have. So for example, if I normalize correctly, um, the zeroth level, the first level will have no quanta of energy, the second level will have one quanta of energy, and then after two quantas of energy, three quantas of energy, and so on. And these quantas of energy are called photons. So I'm going to say uh, the first one is a zero photon state, then, the, then one photon state, two photon state, and so on. That's how we define, uh, number these uh, states. And we often call these number states or Fox states. Now, the oscillator actually requires a two-level system to control it. So basically perform some universal computing. Um, and so the, on the green chip, I have the two-level ancillar which is essentially my transmon ancillar. It's the state-of-the-art ancillar with um, about approximately 300 microsecond lifetime. This is basically what you use as qubits in your systems. Um, so I basically, this is also a multiple, a multiple level system, as you can see, but basically, essentially we use the bottom two levels, the GE level, which is basically your zero one. I'm just gonna call GE two um, uh, to avoid any confusion with the zero one logical qubits I'll be using. So I'm gonna use these GE levels as the two levels for my ancilla, which are effectively our zero and one of the ancilla. And yeah, to control my oscillator. And this essentially is already one physical qubit in my system. So I could compare my oscillator code with this ancilla system, right? But alternatively, I could also think of encoding my information in any, uh, I could basically choose any two levels in this oscillator and use that to encode my quantum information, right? Um, and in order to do that, I need to know which of the two levels would be the longest lived without any error correction. So what is the simplest way possible to encode quantum information here without doing, without any error correction in this oscillator? To know that, I'll point out, point you out to the, uh, dominant noise in this system, dominant error in this system, which is photon loss, which essentially means that a single photon chose to leave your oscillator. That means if you are in the two photon state, you go down to the one photon state. If you are in the three photon state, you go down to the two photon state. So M to M minus one. And the probability of a photon loss event essentially increases with increasing number of photons, which means that as you go up this ladder, your photon loss events increase. So the longest lived uh, lifetime for fo uh, under photon loss, sorry, the longest lived states under photon loss would be the uh, bottom two levels, 
the zero and one states. And this would be the best encoding possible without doing error correction. So this is what we call FOG01 encoding. And the lifetime of this FOG01 encoding essentially is the following. And you can already see that this physical qubit is, all, is better than the transmon physical qubit. So this is actually the best um, two-level system I can realize for memory in my setup. So this is what I would use to define break-even for my oscillator codes. The ratio of the lifetime of my oscillator code and the, ratio, and the lifetime of this FOX01 encoding essentially would define my QEC gain here, which indicates that whatever number I code, if it's greater than one, that already means that you're better than the transmon we've been using. Now, there are three oscillator codes that have already achieved break-even, like as it was evident from the very first graph I showed you uh, of the sort, with three green arrows all pointing to all pointing upwards for only oscillator codes. The very first one was the CAT codes, which barely achieved break-even with um, a 1.1 QEC gain. The next two came out last December, December 2022, within a day's difference. But GKP codes here hold the record at 2.3, and this is what we will be talking about um, in this talk. All right. So there was a first experiment in 2020 uh, by the same group that just fell shy of break-even, and there were three crucial modifications we made to achieve the new QEC gain record here to that experiment. The first one was we used reinforcement learning to optimize experimental parameters. Second, we used a better ancilla. The first ancilla we used was of 100 microsecond lifetime, and this one was 300 microsecond lifetime. And the third one was a more accurate stabilization routine for the code, a more accurate error correction routine for um, the oscillator code. All right. So before I introduce you to the code, I first want to cover some basics of phase space. These codes are defined in uh, phase space of the oscillator, and I'm going to try and um, make it very less physics-y. So first, the errors. Like I said, this photon loss takes you down by one level. Um, in the number state 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, then there could be photon gain with, by, by which you could move up. I've put that down just for completeness sake. A dagger, ty, a dagger type errors are very, very, very small uh, in probability. Now, let's define the phase space. Phase space is comprised of position and momentum. Like I said, these oscillators can be defined by some, so, um, alternatively defined by some basis uh, in which you have position, uh, in, you, in which you ha your states have well-defined positions and momentum. So the position operator is essentially any an operator which does not change your state if it has a well-defined position. A momentum operator is um, is something that does not change your state if it has a well-defined uh, momentum. So that comprises of the um, phase space here. Now. You have momentum, you have position, you would like to have displacements that change the uh, values of these position and momentum. So the eigenvalues of, of the position and momentum states. So I'm going to define my displacement operator, which takes a real argument to traverse in position and change the eigenvalue of the position state. And it will take an imaginary outcome to traverse in momentum and change the eigenvalue of the momentum state. Now. Even though I've drawn this phase space with orthogonal x and p axis, that does not mean that my x and p are orthogonal. They do not commute. And so, since x and p don't commute, displacements in these directions also do not commute. The Lie relationship followed by these displacement operator is given by uh, the following equality. And the a here is the area that's enclosed by the, displace the, by the two displacement vectors. Just to give you an intuition of what these displacement operators look like, you can see that the displacement in position does not change the momentum eigenvalue. So it should be something that either commutes with momentum operator or um, is a function of momentum operator itself. And turns out, it is actually an exponentiated momentum unitary. And similarly, the displacement and momentum is as follows. Now, we're well acquainted with um, phase space of the oscillator. I'm going, to sh I'm going to show you the zero logical code words for GKP. We essentially sh uh, use a vis visualization to see these oscillator codes, which is known as Wigner function, which is, is just the quasi-probability distribution in phase space. 
So for the zero logical, it looks as follows. These are not multiple qubits in a single oscillator. These are just quasi-probability distribution of uh, being in X and P for these states. That uh, blue ones space in denote negative probabilities. The um, red dots denote positive probabilities. That's it. Now, to define stabilize, oh, yeah. I have my wave function also here. The wave functions of those number states look like that above. Um, for the wave function of the zero logical, it's just the marginal probability of occupying the x state, essentially. It's, it looks like the delta function here. So the blobs, even though I've drawn them with some width, these are just points um, in phase space. I've drawn them with some width just to ident for you to identify the pattern here. Yeah. OK, so now let's talk about uh, stabilizers here. You can see that there's some sort of translational symmetry in this, um, in, this, in, the, in the state. So basically, just move the pattern by 2 root pi in x. I've shown you the uh, markings uh, or the x sticks at the bottom. Move this pattern by 2 root pi. The pattern does not change if all of this extends to infinite x and p. Similarly, move this pattern in momentum by 2 root pi, the pattern still does not change. So I, that gives me the liberty to define my stabilizers as follows. These are just displacement in momentum by 2 root pi and displacement in position by 2 root pi. And if you look at the area covered by these two displacements, it's essentially 4 pi, and that means my stabilizers commute according to the above inequality. Uh, sorry, above equality. So my stabilizers commute, which is what I require for my error correcting codes. And now let's define the logical operators. In order to do that, I will show you the, lo um, the one logical state now, which is essentially the following. Look at the marginal probability. It's shifted by 2 root pi. You can also see, uh, see that in the um, quasi-probability distribution. Earlier, at the center x equals 0, I had all the red blobs. Now I have these, this alternating pat pattern of red and blue blobs. So it's essentially the same state displaced by root pi. And that becomes my x logical. So displacement by root pi in um, position essentially is my x logical operator. For the z logical operator, I just say since z lo uh, 0, 1 are eigenstates of z logical, you can see that displacement by root pi in momentum is, um, is going to give you the same pattern. So these are eigenstates of displacement by root pi in momentum. I chose this to be um, displacement momentum essentially because I don't want x and z to commute, right? And you'll see that the area enclosed by the displacements of x and z logicals essentially is pi, and thus these logicals anti-commute, which is what we want for our Paulis. And now I have my y logical defined on the diagonal. So I've defined my logical operators, I've defined my stabilizer operators, I've given you my code. Not so much, because this is an infinite x and p. Uh, this is defined in infinite x and p. It means you have infinite phase space, which means you have infinite photons, infinite energy. This is not a realistic system. So what I would want is a code which is restricted within a finite radius of circle on this uh, phase space lattice of this sort. This circle, if your state lives within this circle, it will have finite number of photons, finite energy, and thus this is called my finite energy GKP. The effect of this, fi of, of chopping your state in this manner is essentially that the marginal probability turns from a delta function to a Gaussian function. This code deformation from ideal GKP to finite energy GKP is done by this non-unitary operator, which is basically applying a Gaussian envelope on your ideal GKP to chop off um, anything out, um, anything outside this circle. Um, like I said, this is a non-unitary operation. Uh, so your stabilizers go from unitary to something non-unitary. So your stabilizers are non-unitary now. But they can be approximated using the ancilla with the following protocol. We'll break down this protocol parts by part, part by part. It's called the small big small protocol because the, um, because I have three conditional displacements here, as you can see. Um, these conditional gates are conditional displacements. If you had to measure an x on your qubit, you would, you would use a control naught gate, right? 
Similarly, if I have to measure a stabilizer, which is a displacement operator, I will use a conditional displacement operator, which is what these conditional displacement uh, gates are. Conditional gates are. Now, these gates, um, as you can see, these gates are basically conditioned on, the, on some Pauli axis of the ancilla, and the rotations on the ancilla just change the Pauli axis. So it, it can be seen as the middle gate is conditioned on the Pauli, uh, Pauli uh, y of the ancilla because of the two rotations by pi over 2. But this is how we write just so that it's easier for the experimentalists to see because they can realize this interaction x tensors sigma z um, exponentiated unitary. Okay. Now, the middle gate um, is essentially something that's related to the stabilizers, but the gates at the very, uh, get, gate at the very beginning at the end it has something like epsilon, which we don't identify what, the, what is that. That's essentially related to delta, the envelope size, which is defined by your envelope operator. And it essentially takes care of this, these Gaussian peaks. So if you wanted to entangle the delta functions with your qubit, it's very easy. You can see that you can take just this middle um, e to the i root pi x tensor sigma z um, operation. Think of the feedback it, uh, it uh, feedback of its fe of the phase, fe phase feedback on the ancilla. So if x was anywhere on uh, an even multiple of uh, root pi, you will apply a phase on the qubit that it rotates by 2 pi or pi given the x value. If you have a Gaussian function, there's an uncertainty, there's an error coming with these Gaussian functions. So you're only making the right rotation at the delta peak, at the peak of the Gaussian. Everywhere else, there is some error. These extra displacements essentially take care of that um, uncertainty. So I would say that the first half of this circuit entangles the Gaussian peaks related to the 0, 1 logical subspace of GKP with the ancilla. So you're entangling a CV state with a DV qubit. When I say DV, I mean discrete variable, two-level system. CV because it has X and P, which, are con which have continuous eigenspectrum. So it's essentially entangling a CV state with a DV ancilla by a rotation of pi um, about the Pauli Z, or Pauli Y in this case, actually. And then the second half is unentangling the same ancilla by another rotation of pi. So it's a ro it's it's a full rotation of 2 pi depending on the fact that you are in the GKP code space. If you're not in the GKP code space, this rotation will not be 2 pi. So if you started with a plus state, if you were in the GKP code space, you will end up in the plus state. So the measurement will give you a plus one outcome. If you were not in the GKP state, there is some probability that you will get minus one as your outcome. So every time you get a minus one as your outcome, that means there was an error in the oscillator or somewhere in the circuit. Okay, and yeah, because uh, so the epsilons are actually very small displacements, so that that gives you the name small big small, a one big conditional displacement sandwiched between two small displacements. This is the experimental circuit that um, we used for this experiment, the experimentalist used for this experiment. Let's break it down into parts. Um, the first chunk is the SZ stabilization. I just showed you one chunk of this circuit. So the first chunk is SZ stabilization. The second chunk is SX stabilization. It's the same circuit, just that your conditional displacements, the middle one will have an I, the uh, other, two, other two displacements will not have an I. So basically the first one looks like that. The second one will have D of root pi over two in the middle and D of I epsilon on either sides. Okay. And these, uh, each of these cycles, each of these SD and SX independently take five microseconds. So, so the circuit is a little slow compared to, say, the surface code cycles. Um, let's break it down into parts. The Rs are actually a rotation on your ancilla. The, condition, the ECD is what um, the experimentalists use to implement conditional displacement in superconducting qubits. Then, I told, you that there, uh, I told you that there was no feedback based on measurement, so I'm not looking at the measurement and do, I did not want to look at the measurement and do something to my qubit in the previous circuit or in this circuit right at, at, the, at the bottom. But in superconducting circuits, while you're measuring your qubit, your qubit is still entangled with the oscillator 
and that cause, causes an unwanted rotation while you're measuring the qubit, but this can be undone. So given you know the time it took to measure your qubit, and you don't know the measurement outcome of your qubit, you can apply, um, you can basically update uh, an, a rotation with, to cancel the rotation implied by this error. So essentially, this is not an, this is not an error you can't correct for, unless you have measurement errors. So, we, uh, so readout errors are not very good in this case either. If you have readout errors, this rotation of phase space, so essentially if your state's like this, it sort of rotates like this, depending on how much um, time your readout took. So if the readouts were faster, it would be great. But it, uh, currently, there's a fundamental limit imposed by something called T1 versus N bar. Nobody understands why that is the case. Um, the idea is you can make your readouts faster by increasing the number of photons in uh, the, your resonators which you use for readouts, but increasing n bar um, somehow affects your qubit lifetime adversely, so you can't do that. So there's some sort of give and take there, we don't understand it, so we can't actually make these readouts faster. And so we can't really avoid these rotation errors. Um, but um, nevertheless, this feedback uh, based on the readout is done in real time, which is not uh, the case in the, uh, in the experiments of surface codes, et cetera. You don't, you don't do any real time feedback there, right? The computer there is basically denoting the FPGA, which is used to do this feedback. And uh, you, it is used to correct for the idle errors during readout, like I said, and it is also used to reset the ancilla. So if you measure the ancilla was an E, you will apply a control not, sorry, uh, a, 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 a a not get conditionally dependent on the classical measurement outcome. And that would reset your qubit to G because for the next round, you again need your qubit to be in G. All right. And then the full cycle takes uh, 10 microseconds of time. This entire circuit has a lot of hidden components you need to optimize. Even in, in the ECD itself, there are so many parameters that you need to optimize. There are hidden nonlinearities you don't like, you don't want it to affect your system. So there's so many parameters to optimize here, and it's just not possible for a single human being to do that. But a machine can do it for you. And that's what Vlad did. So Vlad in this paper actually showed some reinforcement learning methods to control uh, experimental, uh, to, uh, to use optimize, optimization for ex, uh, these quantum control experiments of this sort. And he used essentially this technique to optimize 45 different experimental variables in this experiment. One of the counterintuitive results we found was that the machine learning, the reinforcement learning agent uh, chose to slow down your ECD gate. This is counterintuitive essentially because you would think that the faster the circuit, the lesser is the error probability, so we will just do better by doing, thing, doing everything fast. But the other cho agent chose to do it slower. We have some intuition behind it. I'm just not going to... Um, uh, say anything about it, but if you have questions, I would definitely answer. We also use the RL agent to optimize the delta, uh, the envelope size. Now, why do you need to optimize this delta? Like I said, we need an envelope to restrict the system to a finite number of photons. But at the same time, as soon as I have applied this envelope, I've taken the delta function, the marginal probability to a Gaussian function. That indicates that the zero and one logical states are not orthogonal anymore. And that is what you need for a perfect error correcting code. So once you have this non-orthogonality, you're uh, going further and further away from perfect error correcting code. It's an approximate error correcting code. But it doesn't affect you as badly if you have, if you, if your orthogonality is at the order of um, 10 to the minus seven, so, sorry, if the overlap is of the order of 10 to the minus seven, which is what it is in the current um, experiment, it's fine. So there's some sort of optimal regime we need to achieve. We need to keep the, fi uh, keep the photon numbers at a low to control various system parameters. We need to keep it high for the error correction to work better. And the RL agent optimized it to give us an envelope size which restricted it to a photon number average of 4.7 in the oscillator. Okay, now to, co uh, to show you the um, DK curves and um, compute the QEC gain, I'll first tell you how we did it. And we chose channel fidelity to essentially um, characterize these DK curves. Channel fidelity is essentially the fidelity of the overlap of your state with the state that underwent a certain channel. In this case, 
your, um, your stabilization routine and the error. This uh, fidelity would decrease exponentially uh, given your photon loss uh, error channel. And so by fitting an exponential to the decay curve, you can get the decay rate. But this requires you to go over all the different points in the block sphere, which is infinitely many. It's not possible. Conveniently, Mike Nielsen showed that this actually just got, oh, I'm missing the uh, citation, sorry. Um, but it will come on the next slide. He showed that um, this decay rate is actually just equivalent to um, averaging the decay curves over the six cardinal points on the block sphere. So plus minus x, plus minus y, plus minus z. That's it. So that made our life simpler. And now we essentially use these uh, decay rates to uh, quantify our gain. Gain, I said, was the ratio of life lifetimes of logical qubit and physical qubit, which is equal to the ratio of the physical error rate and the logical error rate. This being greater than one would mean that your logical error rate is, uh, sorry, your physical error rate is higher than your logical error rate. Now for uh, decay and dephasing noise, which your qubits and 0, 1, fork encoding will face, the formula uh, comes down to the following. Essentially, if, you're, um, if, you're, if your qubit's on the pole of the block sphere, it's affected by T1 errors. If your qubit is on the equator of the block sphere, it's affected by T2 errors. And hence the formula. For GKP, it's a Pauli error channel, essentially because the noise just does not prefer plus x over minus x state, plus y over minus y state, et cetera, et cetera. So essentially, the decay curve for plus 1 eigen, Pauli eigenstate and minus 1 Pauli eigenstate should be the same, and hence this formula. And now I'm going to show you the decay curves and these um, decay rates. I'm going to plot, you, plot these three panels. The very first one would show you the decay curve for the ancilla. The second one will show you the decay curve for the 0, 1, fork encoding. And the third one will show you the decay curves for the GKP qubit. On the y-axis, I'm plotting the Pauli operator expectation value. And on the um, x-axis, it's just time in milliseconds. So for the transmon, the shortest lift component in my setup, here's the decay curve. I've already quoted the uh, T1 and T2 lifetimes. I won't talk about it in detail. For the 0, 1, fork encoding, like I told you, it will live longer than my transman, and so it does. The T1 and T2, when I fit the exponentials on these curves, gives us the following T1 and T2 lifetimes, which I will use to extract the uh, 0, 1 uh, decay rate. Finally, for GKP qubit, my decay curves for plus, uh, so for, sorry, for plus minus x states, plus minus y states, and plus minus z states are the following. So, you can see that the y state is, uh, has a slightly worse, curve, worse decay curve than the x and z eigenstates. That's because the y states live on the diagonal. The y logical was defined on the diagonal of the square. So you're more protected against y, er y logical errors than x and z logical errors. And this doesn't give any advantage to the, to the y states because they are not affected by y logical errors, right? So the x and z logical errors, which are worse, both affect the y logical uh, states, and thus your y logical lifetime is worse. The open circles here are your uncorrected GKP states. Just to show that this, this is not a very highly stable state that will just follow the same decay curve even without error correction. With, without error correction, it's actually really bad, worse than the transmon ancillary that you're using. Okay, so I've shown you all the decay curves. Now I'm just going to fit it to an exponential, extract these decay rates and then compute my QEC gain to find that the lifetime of the GKP qubit is to, is, has improved, sorry, the active error correction using GKP has improved the lifetime of my 0, 1 fork encoding by a factor of 2.3. And you can see that this is already better than your transmon. Your transmon is much lower than the 0, 1 fork encoding also. All right. Here is the experimentally extracted Wigner function, the cartoons of which I was showing you, the quasi-probabilities. The very top panel is your zero logical state. The second panel is your one logical state. And the third panel, I'm just showing you the marginal probabilities of zero logical and one logical. Zero logical is shown in blue. One logical is shown in uh, orange. Let's look at the very first column, third row, the wave functions. The blue peaks are situated at even multiples of root pi, which is what zero logical marginal probabilities look like. And the orange peaks are situated at odd multiples of root pi. And you can see that the overlap is very, very small between these two states, almost zero. 
it's a 10 to the minus 7. I'll just reveal that. Um, OK. And at this point, my zero logical and one logical finite energy GKP states look like what I showed you, the cartoons of. Um, it's slightly different because it's the finite energy GKP, so there's some sort of uh, extended width at the center, small, uh, smaller width blobs at the uh, periphery. After 100 cycles, let's look at the second column, third row first. Um, you can see that there are some peaks for, zero, for one logical occurring at, the, at x equals 0. And similarly, for the 0 logical, there are some peaks at the odd multiples of root pi, which indicates the mixing of 0 and 1 logical, because now that some error events have taken place. So error channel essentially starts mixing your logical states. At 200 cycles, this uh, mixing has increased now. Um, and the blue blobs, essentially, which distinguish between your zero logical and one logical, you can see that just sort of starting to disappear from the quasi-probability distribution. At 400 cycles, I am still able to distinguish my zero logical and one logical. That indicates the lifetime is of the order of um, two mill I mean, something around two milliseconds, actually. And finally, at 800 cycles, I have this grid state with no blue dot. Blue dots in this quasi-probability distribution indicate the quantumness of your state, absence of which should not, uh, should not uh, mean that you don't have a quantum state. But in this case, it is a classical mixture of 0 and 1 logical states. I say almost here because there's some, so, there's some blue still there after 800 cycles. But I can say that it's almost a classical mixture of 0 and 1 logical states. Now. I, I will not show you any more Wigner functions, but we carried on this experiment for 10 to the 5 cycles and found that after 10 to the 5 cycles, you were still in the code space with the same grid state. So this, this grid state is very, very unique to GKP states. If you're in this grid state looking thing in your final Wigner state, you're in your GKP code space. So after 10 to the 5 cycles, we were still in this code space. And I have evidence for it. I can show it to you after the talk or like in the question answer session. But for now, take, me, take my word for it. So we wanted to understand exactly why this uh, SPS circuit performs so well in terms of GKP stabilization. Why is it able to keep you within the code space after 10 to the 5 cycles? Um, so, so GKP originally was uh, designed by the GKP Gottesman Kitaev Preskill to correct for displacement errors. Um, more specifically, Gaussian displacement channel, which is a classical noise channel. What I have here is a quantum noise channel, a hat, photon loss. It's a discrete error. It's not like displacements. It's not a continuous error. It's a discrete error. Um, how, is it, how, how is GKP correcting for it so efficiently? So we decided to use the POVM approach, the Krauss map approach. We studied the Krauss map created by these two measurements, measurement circuits. You have two measurements here. So you will have four possible operators you could apply uh, on your oscillator state. G, 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 E, E, G, E, E, define the, denote the measurement outcomes you got. So you, in this circuit, we started with G, and we hope to end up in G if we were in the oscillator state. So an outcome of G, G is trivial. It indicates that perhaps there was no error. It doesn't give you any information about error. Let's just uh, put it like that. GE or EG indicate there was an error. EE also indicates there was an error. So now I'm going to look at these matrices, uh, KGG, KEG, KGE, KEE. The next thing I show you is not an experimental data. It's a, it's a theorist calculation to just show you how these things work. So I'm going to plot the transition probability. There should be a mod square there. But anyway. Um, I'm going to show you the, tra tran the transition probability of taking my code states to the error states and vice versa using these k maps, uh, sorry, k operators. The uh, states defined by the, oper uh, by the subspaces C0 through C5 here that I have on the input and output um, axis are as follows. The C0 is my code space. It's comprised of two orthogonal logical states. I don't write 0, 1, plus, minus, because they're not exactly orthogonal. What I choose, chose here for were, were the Hadamard eigenstates, the plus, minus Hadamard eigenstates, which for GKP, no matter what the envelope is, is always or completely orthogonal. So I chose those two states. Um, and C0 comprises of these two. C1 is essentially a single photon loss or photon gain applied to uh, my code states. 
So the first order error state, like I said, A and A dagger were my errors. C3 to C, through C5 were essentially, when I applied two, fo two photon loss or two photon gain events, essentially a degree two polynomial and A and A dagger applied to the code state, that sort of error. So that's my second order error state subspace. Now, like I said, KGG should not, should not do anything amazing. It should, like, it should not take care of errors. And when I plot KGG for these subspaces, the transition probability for KGG, I find the following. I'm living within each of these um, blocks I show you. What that means is if you're in the green box, that means you, you, you've put in your logical state and what you get out after applying KGG was also a logical state. So it just applied either a logical operation or a logical identity. In this case, you can see that it's off diagonal, and that's because the SPS operator itself on the GKP code space applies a y logical, uh, y logical operation deterministically. This is not an error. We know that it should be applying a y logical operation. For the, all the other error states, second order error states, first order error states, you can see that you are within the orange box and the yellow box. The orange box indicates that you, you've taken your first order error state as input, and what you get out after applying KGG is also a first order error state. And the same thing for the second order error state. So like I said, it does nothing, KGG does nothing, it just apply, uh, keeps you within, the, within each of these subspaces, no error corrected. And E outcome is interesting, and when we look at the KEG out, um, pro, uh, transition probabilities, we see that we are restricted to, with maximum probability, we are restricted to the lower triangular region of this block diagonal matrix. What that means is, um, for example, if you're below the orange box, it means that you've taken a first order error state as your input and thrown out a state in the code space as your output. So you've pushed your first order error state down to the code state. Then if you're below the yellow box, you've pushed a first, second order error state down to the first order error state. So you're pushing yourself down towards the code space, which is in the, error, in, in the favor of um, error correction. And this is essentially like a single step probabilistic correction. I say probabilistic because all of these, num these numbers are not exactly one, but they are, for example, for the uh, numbers below uh, the orange box, it's 0.999 something. So it, uh, pushes down a first order error state with a probability of 0.99 to the code space. For KEG, it's the same thing. For KE, it's something better. It takes a second order error state and pushes it all the way down to the code space. So it's like a two step correction in one go. So now I can say that this KGG is sort of applying, so it's sort of trickling your error state down to the code space through better and better, less worse error states. So if I, ha if I define all my errors as polynomials in A's and A daggers, my SPS map just pushes, keeps pushing my error states down towards my code space step by step, probabilistically, I say, because if you've noticed, there is some non-zero probability of being in these uh, uh, black circles. And that indicates that with some non-zero probability, I could be thrown to a worse error state also. But these probabilities are very, 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 very small. So most of the times, I'm actually doing something good to my state. And I'm not going to show it to you, but we just studied some Monte Carlo simulations where we would we, we track the path, the correction paths for various different errors like a, a dagger, a square, a dagger square, two types of errors. If we leave the oscillator long enough, and long enough is like, at max 10 rounds, not more than that, 10 cycles, not more than that, you always come back to the right state without a logical error, in fact. So that sort of tells you how all of this, uh, this entire stabilization uh, routine works so efficiently. Now we have a theoretical proof of everything that I just showed you, but that would just take longer to finish this talk, so I'm not going to emphasize on those. This is just the evidence of how stabilization routine works so efficiently. Well, I've told you the stabilization works fine, but I still have a QEC gain of 2.27. Why not 10? Why not 20? Why not 100? That's because of the shortest lived component in my circuit, my ancillar. My ancillar, like I said, during the readout, I need to apply some correction update, and it will be messed up if I have a readout error. So what happens is, um, if you have a bit flip during a readout, G goes to E, and you've applied a wrong correction because the state was rotated during this idling, 
based on the fact that the qubit was in G, but you've corrected thinking that the qubit was in E, and these two outcomes will have different um, correction updates, and you've corrected it to the wrong state, so it's some sort of rotation. This is hazardous because a, lo a rotation by pi over 2 in phase space takes you from the zero logical state to the plus logical state, so from the x basis to the minus basis. It's just, it is the Hadamard gate on your circuit, so it, if, if this readout error is really bad, it could be a logical Clifford error. Right now it's not, which is why we're actually getting these error rates. But yeah, this could be actually very fatal. Another um, component in my SPS circuit where ancillas could be fatal is the uh, conditional displacement. So we'll focus on the big condi biggest conditional displacement, that is the central conditional displacement in my SPS routine. What it does is it takes, uh, it, it entangles your ancilla, uh, so it takes your ancilla and with the G of the ancilla, you will do nothing to your state, and with the E of the ancilla, you would have taken the state and shifted by two root pi. So for the GKP state, it's a logical identity, but this is what you would be doing to your state. If there was an error, you could fall anywhere between this path. Basically, you will not complete this displacement, and you, you will fall somewhere between this path. The pink region here is a logical error, because the greens show that if you, if you end up in the green region after an ancilla DK, you with further error correction rounds, you will be corrected back to the right state. But if you fall in the pink region, that will be a logical Pauli error because then further error correction rounds will correct you back to the one logical error if you started in the zero logical state. So ancilla errors actually can give you a logical Pauli error. Now, you can also have dephasing or phase flips. Phase flips do nothing during readout. Um, during conditional displacements, um, I'm going to, again, ignore the small conditional displacements. Just take my word for it. It induces con correctable uh, errors. During the big conditional displacement, which is essentially to the i root pi x tensor sigma z, if there is a sigma z error, it will commute through that gate, right? But the Clifford rotation by pi over 2 on the ancilla will convert this sigma z to a sigma y, and then that sigma y error will affect the next conditional displacement, just changing the sign of this conditional displacement. So if you wanted to displace by epsilon, you will, you will be displacing by minus epsilon instead. But then again, this is a correctable displacement, and it will be corrected in the next uh, QEC round. So sigma z is not that bad. For us, sigma x and sigma y are um, basically what's limiting this QEC gain right now. Sigma z also, I mean, I wouldn't want I wouldn't want my sigma z to uh, be high either because if this correctable displacement error happened over and over again, it could accumulate to give me a logical Pauli error also. But for now, the bottleneck um, is uh, sigma x and sigma y errors of the ancilla errors limiting your QEC gain. To prove this, we performed a small experiment where we just made our ancilla bad by purposely ex uh, injecting noise to the ancilla, making it worse and worse, and we plotted the following to see, basically see the logical error rate dependence of uh, GKP on the relaxation or bit flip errors and dephasing or phase flip errors. And we found that both of the, these have linear dependence, but for the relaxation rate, things are much worse for my logical error rate. If I compare the slope of these two, this relaxation rate or bit flips, these bit flips are 65 times worse for my GKP states. Uh, logical error rate. The dephasing error rate, I've shown you actually a very small plot, and again, uh, I would uh, warn you that you should only take these graphs for qualitative purposes. This is an old graph. We had a more recent graph, but this I find more intuitive, so I've just used this. So just for qualitative purposes that this is a linear dependence, we're going to look at this graph. The dephasing rate actually goes non-linear after some, uh, after, uh, to the right, on the right, sorry, to the left of this graph. So if I keep increasing dephasing error rate, the logical error, uh, error rate dependence on dephasing becomes nonlinear. So de very, very high dephasing is also not very good for you, but currently the bottleneck lies at ancilla relaxation or bit flip errors. This is a good news for bias noise ancilla, which is an alternative we can use here. Bias noise ancilla have relatively less bit flips than phase flips. So the idea is you use these ancillas instead of the transmon ancilla, and that, relative, that effectively should 
increase the QEC gain. This is an ongoing experiment um, in the Devray lab and actually at MIT as well. They're both using different bias noise qubits. One of them are using Fluxonium, one of them are using Kerkats. And finally, I will leave you with the highest lifetime for quantum memory of 1.82 milliseconds with GKP qubits. This comes at a low of logical error probability of 10 to the minus 3 for one single QEC cycle. This is the lowest recorded error probability for any error correcting code for, memory, for a memory experiment. And, and another thing to note is that this 10 to the minus 3 is lower than the surface code threshold, so you can use this for concatenation. Now, for concatenation, we, we, are still, uh, we still need to bridge some gap uh, to reach here. For example, I mean, you can take your good LDPC codes also. It's not restricted to surface codes. I'm just using that as an example. We would first like to use the bias noise ancilla approach to increase the QEC gain further. Next, we would also like to realize the entangling GKP gates to realize stabilizer measurements here. And then I have only focused this talk on memory experiments, but we can also do universal quantum computation with these GKP qubits. I have some proposals for error-corrected gate teleportation from DV qubit to a CV state to GKP qubits here. And we can make GKP magic states with better success probability. The bottom two are uh, work in preparation. And then I present you an alternative approach of encoding um, error correction, sorry, logical code words with multiple oscillators. You don't have to concatenate. In fact, concatenation itself is a lattice approach, but, like, but we don't see it as such. So essentially, the idea is you take n oscillators, and then we have, to, we have a two-n-dimensional space. In this two-n-dimensional space, you can, you can choose your favorite lattice, favorite symplectic lattice, with a volume which will encode a qubit, a qtrit, or whatever you, you would like. That's what would decide the volume of your lattice. And then impose restrictions like you want low weight stabilizers and nearest neighbor couplings or whatever to identify the favorite la lattice you want. And that could effectively give you a better code. And an example of that would be we took two oscillators and defined the tesseract lattice, a 4D lattice, on top of this code. And what we, what we, what we did here was, because of the uh, increased degrees of freedom in this higher dimensional lattice, we found an alternative path to measure the stabilizers, which did not cross the logical error region that I showed you, the pink region, as much. And that decreased the dependence of logical error rates, theoretically, by a factor of 10 on the ancillary on the ancillar decay rates so this gives you an a hint so this is this this uh, this de this decrease on the dependence of on the uh, ancillary decay rates is not as good as using bias noise ancillary but this just gives you an idea of the nuance hidden or the advantages hidden in this alternative type of encoding so this is this approach has not been pursued much and yeah I leave you with the following statement that the lifetime of quantum error correction can be improved by a factor of two using active quantum error correction with GKP codes. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. I think we can still take a few minutes uh, for questions if people can hold off on lunch for a while. I think you have a question there. There. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Shraddha, for the amazing talk. I can't uh, hear you. Oh, I said thank you for the amazing talk and uh, congratulations on, on the results. Could you please comment on the prospects for quantum communication? And what I mean is the following. You have your super nice encoded state in this cavity, but is there any hope to get it out um, you could use transduction, which right now is a, stands at a very low efficiency of 20%, but transduction essentially converts these microwave frequencies to optical frequencies, so you've converted, you've taken your quantum information in these superconducting fridges to optical photons in your communication channel. We're hoping one day this transduction, this conversion becomes much better and has a much better efficiency, but right now it's, it's, it's very low and 
I would just uh, stick to quantum computing and memory. Thank you. We have one over there. Oh, uh, 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 thank you. Um, so you define your QEC gain. I'm, I'm here. Oh, hi. Yeah. You define your QEC gain by after defining uh, various, uh, after measuring various decay rates and then took an arithmetic mean. Of Sorry, those. I can't hear you uh, clearly. You, you defined your, uh, the, the capital gamma that characterizes the overall decay rate to be the arithmetic mean of various decaying rates. Mm -hmm. Why specifically arithmetic mean? In relation, well, relatedly, uh, you know, you, uh, you measure the lifetime against the wall clock. But in computational complexity, there is no unit, which translates to the question like, when we talk about the gain from the QEC, uh, perhaps the operationally meaningful question is, how many operations can we do more? How many so, operations? Right. Yes. So, so this was just a memory experiment, if I understand your question correctly. It wasn't about gates yet. Um, for example, if, if I were to actually compare uh, uh, the gain for gate operations, I wouldn't even use the 0 and fork encoding because 0 and fork encoding has a really low, a really, really, it has really bad gates. Um, I would compare it first of all with transmons. Um, and right now there have not been any gate operation realization. So this is strictly a memory experiment. Did I, did I answer your question? Uh, well, I, I guess my, it's, it's more of a comment that, you know, when you, when we, when you say, oh, we have increased the lifetime of, of a qubit, mm -hmm. uh, there is a, many assumptions that goes into that statement. And uh, it's not always meaningful to compare the, compare the lifetime against the wall clock. And especially when you uh, measure the, the decay rate, for example, why arithmetic mean? There could be other mean. Yes, I agree. But... At the end, I showed you the error probability per QEC cycle. So that tells you that after one QEC cycle, during an entire QEC cycle, the error probability, uh, a log the logical error probability was 10 to the minus three. So I think that's, um, th and that also is the lowest achieved error rate per cycle, error probability per cycle. All right, we have one over here to your far right. Um, <clears throat> these codes are originally had um, syndromes that were continuous, you know, and yeah. you guys somehow managed to show that you don't really need that. You're back to discrete syndromes. You use only an ancilla. Can you convey some intuition uh, for us about how you're you're able to to do that? We essentially um, so. I already showed you how we have code states and discrete error states because I'm applying discrete errors on these states. And if I were to compare the overlap of these states with the error states, these are actually highly orthogonal. Um, as a, I mean, at, very close to how the logical states are orthogonal. So essentially, that's why I took the base, took this as my basis. And now the idea was I wanted to see, we wanted to see how um, your stabilization routine, sorry, go ahead. But even <clears throat> there, you have two losses too, right? You have one and two loss, and you have gains, but your syndrome's only formally a bit. So how is this even? Yes. How does it even know what to do that it's supposed to do something different for two okay, losses yes. versus for one? So, game? so one, it is not a deterministic correction; it is a probabilistic correction, essentially because of the reason you pointed out. It's a bitwise ancilla. That that's uh, that would be uh, one answer. Another um, addition to that answer would be that. The epsilon that I chose is actually effectively correct. So when I get a G um, as an outcome, the whole entanglement disentanglement worked out perfectly fine. If I get an E as an outcome, um, the Gaussian entanglements, the CVDV entanglement works in such a way that it means that I've done the whole entanglement disentanglement. And in addition to that, I've applied an, a minus two epsilon conditional displacement, which is like the corrective conditional displacement you see in most of these uh, phase estimation techniques that Barbara has proposed. And that essentially takes care of this errors correction bit, uh, by small amounts. And that's why this is probabilistic. This is not deterministic error correction. 